Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Resurrection Sunday to you. Are you guys doing good? Yeah, oh, good. I was worried there for a second. Hey, let's all stand together. Uh, what a cool thing to be right here uh, worshiping the Lord. Um, we're glad you're here. This is a chance just to, to be lively. If there, you know, the Bible says um, that, uh, you know, we are to make a joyful noise to the Lord. And I love the word enthusiasm. Entheos is the Greek. It means, uh, it, it means uh, in God, actually, is the Greek word for being enthusiastic. So if there's ever a time to belt it out and sing, I'd say Resurrection Sunday's it. So you guys ready for that? All right, let's give it a whirl. I'm, I'm gonna warm you up before the band gets fired up. So here we go. Praise the Lord together, singing hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Okay, you gotta be way louder than that. That was like, uh, like seriously. The problem you guys have is we already have how many services to compare them to? Five services already. We can, and you're, you're the, like the quietest one so far. That's embarrassing. I'd be embarrassed. <laughs> so, so let's build that out. Here we go. Praise the Lord together singing hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Yeah, that's better right there. Okay, right down the half. Here we go. Praise the Lord together singing, praise the Lord together singing hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Okay, this side's winning. Um, uh, okay, <laughs> like it's a competition. Okay, four groups. Are you guys ready? From here to the aisle, you're group one, group two, group three, and group four. Okay, here we go. Praise the Lord together singing. 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 Praise the Lord together all right, this group gets the most improved. All right, that's good. Uh, well, uh, Lord, we are so thankful for this group, just a chance to gather around you, Lord. You're the centerpiece of our attention, our affection. You alone deserve all glory and honor. And I pray that you'd find a congregation here that's ready to worship in spirit and in truth. Lord, that we give you all the glory that's due to your name as the psalmist declared in Psalm 115, not unto us, but unto thy name, be glory and honor forever. Lord, like John the Baptist, um, Lord, may you increase, may we decrease so that you would increase. Lord, be honored in this place. And I pray you just bless each person. Um, I pray you'd soften our hearts and even the hardest, I pray you'd soften and that we might receive the word even today and be ready to just be in tune with you and, and worshipful of you, Lord. So bless this time, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, amen. amen. Why don't you guys take it away? Let's go. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty? And so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You laid down your life That I would be set free you've done for me. 
Amen. <laughs> oh, Lord, it's so true. We're thankful uh, as Christians, Lord, to know that we serve a risen Savior. Not only can we face tomorrow, but we can face eternity with confidence in you, Lord. I pray, Father, that as we open our Bibles now, that you'd speak to us by your Holy Spirit, give us understanding, help us to apply your word practically. Um, again, just soften our hearts to receive your word. In Jesus' name, amen. We're in the Gospel of John. Uh, we, we don't skip a verse, a word, um, a book. We just go right through. So we're in John. And what we do normally is we take our text from our upcoming Wednesday study. We pull out a small text on the weekend and kind of zoom in and focus. And that's what we're going to do today. Wednesday night, we're in John 2. So why don't you turn with me to John chapter 2 for today's study. You might say, well, Brett, it's Resurrection Sunday. Shouldn't you be doing a resurrection teaching uh, from the Bible? And the answer is yes. And it just so happens it worked out beautifully. One of the key passages concerning the resurrection uh, we find in John chapter 2. So if you turn there, John chapter two, if you don't have your Bible, uh, Eighthly Creek, we're kind of the church that everybody brings their Bibles, which I'm really thankful for that. Um, but if you didn't, uh, particularly this Sunday, since uh, it's, it's Resurrection Sunday, I'm gonna um, put our main text here up on the screen for you too, so you can follow along. Uh, it's John chapter two, verse 18. Then answered the Jews, and said to him, what sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? And Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, 40 and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. What sets Christianity apart from all other religions? It's really simple. No other religious leader, guru, um, starter of some cult or whatever, uh, none of them did anything really to substantiate their claims. But what a claim. Can you imagine today if someone says, kill me, and three days later, I'm going to raise from the dead. And that'll prove it. And if I don't raise from the dead, then you can know I was totally wacko, a weirdo, and you can forget me through all of history. But instead, Jesus said, no, if you destroy this body, three days later, I'll raise it up. Now, I love it. When did the disciples believe the scripture and the word which Jesus had said? I love it right here. It tells us they remembered it um, when he had risen from the dead. Uh, Jesus had told them many times, and, and now they're, it's finally clicking in their minds and their hearts. They're saying, wow, he talked about this, <clears throat> that, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> that he would rise up from the dead. And Jesus did that, and that's when he, his disciples remembered and they believed the scripture. What scripture? Old Testament. Did you know the Old Testament scriptures actually mention the, the resurrection of the Messiah? It, it was somewhat cryptic, I'll admit, but nonetheless, they mentioned it uh, in several places. In Psalm, uh, there's the reference of, of the resurrection. Um, 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 Isaiah 53, there's a mention of it. Daniel chapter 9 uh, talks about it. There's, there's places where the resurrection is mentioned. So now they believe the scripture and what Jesus had said. I love that about that. The resurrection is what really changed the world. The resurrection is what gives us hope and joy. Boy, the world today, wouldn't you agree, needs some hope, needs some joy. Um, people are feeling pretty empty and, and uh, suicide is spiking. People are depressed, people are broke. Uh, inflation is hurting people and just the evil in the world and stuff that, you know, you can find yourself uh, kind of troubled. Like the chocolate Easter buddy that went in for some therapy. And uh, the therapist says, well, how do you feel? And he says, I feel so hollow inside. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, the emptiness of this life. In fact, this life would be empty if it weren't for the truth that there's life after death. We don't live as Christians for the here and now. We live because we get to live, like we're just saying, we live, we can face tomorrow and we can face all of eternity. So the resurrection is such a key and important part of our Christian faith. 
Uh, I want to show you just three simple things today about the resurrection that I think are important for us to talk about. And that is number one, what does the resurrection do? The resurrection is validation of Christ's claims. Um, Jesus made a lot of claims anyone could have made. You could walk up to me today and say, I am the Messiah, the son of the living God. And I would have to say, uh, am I, why should I believe you? I've been told that, by the way. I've been told uh, that I, I met God at Pioneer uh, Square there in downtown Portland. Um, he said I was God. So I was like, wow, that's interesting. Uh, but I didn't believe him. Why? Because there's no validation. Jesus validated all of his claims. What were Jesus's claims? He said stuff like, um, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and my Father are one. Philip, the disciple, said, Jesus, show us the Father. And Jesus said, oh, Philip, have I been with you so long? Um, don't you realize by now, he's saying, that if, you know, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, I and my Father are one? That's a pretty big claim. You better back it up. And Jesus did. When he said, you want a sign to, to know that what I'm saying, the claims that I'm making? Jesus um, also claimed to have the power to forgive sin. How does he have the power to forgive sin? Remember the paralytic they brought to Jesus? And the first thing Jesus says is, your sins be forgiven you. And the, the cynics, the skeptics, well, how does this guy think he's got the power to forgive sin? And Jesus, knowing what they were thinking, turned to them and said, that you may know I have the power to forgive sin. He then turned to the paralytic and said, take up your bed and walk. And he got up and walked away. It's kind of interesting. The most important problem that needed to be solved was the man's sins, not his paralytic condition. Uh, that was number two, but having his sins forgiven. And Jesus was making that claim. I have the power to forgive sin. What gives him that power? His death on the cross, but not that alone. If Jesus would have just died on a cross and ceased to exist in oblivion, then uh, that, wouldn't have, that would have been good enough. We would have to say, yeah, whatever. Because that would have been like every other person in history, but Jesus was different. He died on the cross and then he rose from the grave. Some people, I've heard churches, I've even heard pastors say stuff like, um, you don't really have to believe the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to be a Christian. Because uh, some people struggle with that one. Oh, you believe in Jesus actually raising from the dead? Um, and <clears throat> some of you might say, yeah, that is a stretch. And, <clears throat> and uh, maybe I can just be a Christian. I'll be a Jesus follower without the resurrection. And people say you can do that, but don't believe them. The Bible teaches that's a false claim. Without the resurrection, um, we're toast. Christ's resurrection from the dead is not a peripheral issue on Christianity. It's a foundation of our faith. It's the most important part. In fact, it sets Christianity apart from all the others because um, Paul the Apostle even uh, emphasizes this when he said in 1 Corinthians 15, 17, he said, and if Christ be not raised, raised from the dead, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. The word futile just means a waste of time. You being a Christian, walking around, going to church, being a Christian, what a waste of time if Jesus didn't raise from the dead. And you're also still in your sins, which means you're still doomed to hell and destruction and wrath and judgment. We'd all be toast without the resurrection. The testimony of Jesus' followers is that he rose from the grave. They all saw it. He voluntarily died at the hands of his executioners. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. And on the third day, he rose from that tomb three days later and he left the tomb empty. Witnesses saw that Jesus had uh, uh, not only left an empty tomb, but they saw a resurrected Christ who appeared, by the way, to hundreds of people. In fact, uh, 500 people saw him all in one moment. That's a big crowd. That's a lot of eyewitness accounts of a resurrected Jesus. Acts chapter one, verses one through 11. 1 Corinthians 15, verses one through eight, talks about how people saw Jesus after he rose from the grave. The resurrection is a fact better attested than any other uh, recorded in history, uh, whether ancient or modern. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is so out there. I mean, there's a reason why <clears throat> billions of people are gathering on this very morning in churches around the globe because they believe in a risen savior. Um, Jesus made a claim that had he not risen from the grave, his claim would have been dead the very moment he died in Jerusalem that day. But actually the resurrection of Christ is what proves his claims. Romans chapter one, verses three through four, uh, Paul says, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh, 
and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Now, I know this is kind of a mouthful from the King James Bible, but what is it saying? The resurrection of the dead provides proof that Jesus is the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness, and that's proven by the resurrection of Jesus. Um, Buddha didn't raise, Muhammad didn't raise, Confucius, Oprah, none of them rose from the grave. Um, only Jesus is the one who rose from the grave, uh, proving his claims of anything, let alone being the son of God. So that's an important part of our faith. I hope you never uh, go with those that try to dismiss the resurrection as unnecessary. Um, it is the, the most important part of our faith. Uh, it's the hinge upon which all of Christianity swings. But not only do we see the resurrection as validation of Christ's claims, but the resur resurrection also gives expectation of life after death. This has been an age-old question, you know, what happens when you die? And, and maybe you've had moments in your life where you've had to kind of think about it, even though a lot of people don't like thinking about that. Um, but you're sort of forced from time to time, like when you're at a memorial service or a funeral service. I think... Um, uh, I've never been that pro uh, uh, open casket services. Uh, maybe you've been to an open casket service. Um, but I have to admit over the years, I'm almost wondering if there's value to that. I'll tell you why. Because an open casket service, there's this profound sense that when you walk by the casket as the tradition, you know, you walk by and you see the dearly departed body. And there's this overwhelming sense that that person's not there anymore. And that can either really sadden you and you say, man, that's just a shell. It's very clear when you see a dead body, you just think, that's just a shell. That's not my friend or my family member who I loved. But then the question in your mind is, but where are they? Did they just cease to exist out of existence? And there's something within humanity that struggles with just believing they cease to exist. And I think you got to listen to that a little bit. Because the Bible teaches there is life after death. And you do not, in fact, cease to exist. Um, Socrates, uh, he was the big muscular Greek philosopher 400 years before the birth of Christ. Um, but he got into some trouble and they made him drink a cup of hemlock poison uh, to kill himself kind of thing. Um, and uh, all of his, you know, friends and some of his, you know, students and stuff were there around him. This artist, this is, a, you know, several hundred year old painting, an artist depicted of Socrates drinking the cup of hemlock. But his friends were asking him, Socrates, shall we live again when we die? As, he, as the dying philosopher could only reply, I hope so, but no man can really know. And then he drank the hemlock and died. Um, can man really know? Job and his friends from the Bible, in fact, the oldest book in the Bible, Job and his friends pontificate over this question in Job 14, 14, when he said, if a man die, shall he live again? He said, they're asking, is there life after death? And this is where the resurrection of Jesus Christ comes in. It gives you and me the absolute hope that there is life beyond the grave. Um, for some people, the resurrection and the idea of life uh, beyond the grave, life after death, it's hard for them to imagine or believe because it's something we haven't seen with our eyes for ourselves. It's something we can't touch and feel, so it's hard for us to believe. It's hard for us to imagine. But can I just warn you about, just because you can't imagine something doesn't mean you shouldn't believe it's necessarily true. I mean, think about the things that have happened in many of our lifetime that you couldn't have imagined. Um, I remember when I was a kid, my grandfather, he was a construction uh, you know, he, uh, superintendent. Um, he, was, uh, he worked for Walt Disney, built uh, part of Pirates of the Caribbean and uh, the Small World and all that. Um, and, um, but I remember in Southern California, I got to ride around in his truck and he had a phone in his truck back in like 1971. And uh, I remember that was the coolest thing. Now, for you uh, Gen Zers and stuff, a phone in your truck in those days, you needed a truck to carry the phone. It was so huge. Um, and you could only talk uh, one way. So you're like, you know, you talk to your friend and then you have to say over, and then the person would say you know, his thing, and then he'd say over. Uh, it was like more like a CB radio, but still, phone in the truck. Um, who would have imagined 
Um, you know, I was uh, a few years back, I was at the Red Sea with some Athey Creekers there in Israel. We were sitting around uh, sipping tea and just enjoying. We were talking about technology. And I was, I was showing a new feature on my phone back then. It was a while back. But I was saying, you know, I could start my pickup truck that's parked in Tualatin. I could start that up right here from the Red Sea uh, with my phone. And they were like, no way. And they did, some people didn't believe me. So I said, watch this. And I called my wife, Deb. I said, hello, honey. Hey, could you walk out by my truck? She says, okay. And she walked out by my truck. And then I pushed the start button. And then we all heard the motor. And they all went, wow, no way. And we were all amazed. Now, man, I, with my phone, I can, you know, take my tailgate down. I can make my bed cover retract. I can uh, pretty much load anything in there without, which is my iPhone. Like, it's amazing. Uh, I don't have to get out of the, the, the truck, you know. And, um, but I can, like, who would have imagined this? Nobody would have imagined in your pocket you could have the kind of power we have. Now, you Gen Zers, like, Brett, you're such an old dude, man. What phones, it's like there's nothing. But you got to remember, before you were born, we were using like blankets with fires and smoke signals and stuff, telling, <laughs> giving messages. So we didn't have text messages and stuff. Um, it, it was different back in the old days. But, but can you imagine cowboys imagining a, a, a phone and the use of it, or even a pickup truck for that matter? Um, they wouldn't have imagined such, such things. Um, but actually, what's interesting is everything is full of wonder and, and impossibility until we get used to it. Now we're all used to our phones. We're like, yeah, whatever. I can, I can you know, push a button and get, get uh, you know, food delivered to my door, uh, whatever. And, and because we're used to it. Resurrection owes the incredible portion of its marvel to our never having come across it in our observation. We've never seen it tasted it, touched resurrection. It's hard for us to even fathom. Um, you might be saying, Brett, it's hard to believe something I can't see. Um, life after death, we can't see it, so how do we believe in it? But, um, you know, don't let that bother you, really. We, we don't see time, but we believe it, it exists. We don't really see love. You see acts of love, but you don't really see love, um, the, the, the actual emotion behind it, or, or gravity, even air. Do you believe in air? I do too. <laughs> but have you ever really seen air? Oh, I see wind. No, you saw air that is affecting something else, but you're not actually seeing. Like, it's amazing the stuff that, is, that we can't see that's actually real. Um, imagine you're streaming at home your favorite TV show, live streaming, and 15 minutes into the program, you turn it off, your TV off. Question, um, did you, when you shut off your TV and then laid there and closed your eyes, um, what happened to the program? Is it gone forever? Did it cease to exist? Well, actually, uh, what's even kind of weird to think about, um, it's still in the air um, as electromagnetic radiation. It's there. All you have to do is turn your TV back on and your Wi-Fi signal reconnects and everything starts getting all... It's, it's been there in, in binary code. Like, it's an amazing thing that even our technology has kind of given us sort of an idea of what happens. Just because the television is off, the program doesn't cease to exist. If you're driving down the road and you have your AM, FM radio on and you turn it off, um, just because you turned off the radio doesn't mean the music stopped. It's still going over the airwaves and you can't even see it going through the air, but it's there. Just because the body has died, the soul does not cease to exist. The Bible says your soul continues. During our physical life on earth, you know, we, we live in kind of a three-dimensional world that we know of uh, generally. We have our five senses. Some people say we have a sixth sense. You know, that would be more of a, the power of perception, uh, but not a, one of the five senses. Um, I don't know. But the soul, our soul, the part of you that thinks and feels, what dimension does that exist in? Have you ever thought about that? Because it's kind of hard to pin it down. It doesn't live in your brain or in your heart. Um, why does your stomach feel sick when you're nervous? Um, where, what is the deal with your soul? Um, and even though science is trying to figure out the dimensions, Albert Einstein, in his theory of relativity, talked about multiple dimensions. Um, when, when he uh, figured it all out, the mathematical equation, um, people said, Albert Einstein, who, who understands this other than you? And he said, two people. And he said, well, they said, who, who are they? He said, well, me. And he said, the other person I'm still looking for. Now, after Einstein was done figuring it, then others confirmed and saw that what he was talking about was true and legit. But even that led to some interesting ideas about dimensions and what have you. 
String theory, for example, suggests there's 13 dimensions, three of which we know, the other 10 we really can't know or, or really discern. Could this be what Paul the apostle was talking about when he said this mysterious statement in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 9 and 10? He said, but as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard. That's like the stuff your five senses don't discern. Neither have entered into the heart of man. That's your soul. That's your inner part that thinks and feels. I have not seen nor ear heard. Neither you're entered into the heart of man. The things which God has prepared for them that love him. Now, some people have, uh, you know, attributed this to heaven, which um, that's not really what the scripture's talking about. I, I think you could in some ways apply this about heaven, but I think this is talking about much more. In fact, when you read it on, um, it even gives us more clarity. It says in verse 10, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit, for the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. What are we talking about here, Paul? We're talking about the deep things of God. Would you agree that God is somewhat deep? A topic that's somewhat deep? Like, can you really dive into the depths of who God really is? Good luck with that. Um, but it says here, you know, eye has not seen nor ear has heard. It's not even entered into the heart of man the things which God prepared for them that love him. That's his people, believers, Christians. But God hath revealed them the, the wonderful things that he's prepared unto us, the Christians, by his spirit. You see, where science fails, I wonder if spirituality, that is true spirituality from the Bible, from, from, the, from the, the book of the Bible, um, that says the, the Holy Spirit reveals to us, non-scientific people, um, the, the, the mysteries, the deep things of God. I think that's what the Bible's talking about. Um, the things God has prepared for them that love him are not gotten through your eyes or through the ears or by reasoning in your soul. And then how are you gonna get them? By the Spirit revealing to us. Um, I, I do appreciate science. Um, there's a lot of false science today, and I, I reject that. Um, but I love real science, you know, like the scientific method that we used to use, stuff like that. I appreciate that. Uh, one of the things science has dabbled with is the idea of string theory that I mentioned earlier, but, you know, the 13 dimensions in the universe. And, um, and the whole thing about string theory is, um, you know, it can't be proven. We, we haven't proven it yet. If string theory uh, is true, then God created it. But if it's not true the multiple dimensions outside of what we experience here in this life, um, it's at least an interesting metaphor in our attempt to understand God. I've talked about this in other sermons where God is outside of time and space. He's not limited to our laws of physics. Um, the, the Bible's mysterious when it says stuff like, with the Lord a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years with the Lord is as a day. And Ecclesi Ecclesiastes 3.15, when it talks about how the things that are past have not yet happened. And the things that have already happened are uh, not yet. And the things that, that uh, will be in the future <laughs> are um, past tense. Like it's this verse, you're like, what in the world? It, it seems that God exists outside of our laws. So is it possible, like for example, when Jesus said something like in John 14, in my father's house are many, what? Mansions, if you have a King Jimmy. Uh, the word mansion is probably an unfortunate translation. That was uh, the translators uh, hoping something, a mansion. And you're probably picturing yourself getting to heaven, there's your Piddock mansion up there, you know? And you can kind of go, that's my house. But, um, but the, um, the newer translations say, in my father's house are many what? Anybody? Dwelling places. That's probably getting better. You say, well, that's not as fun as a mansion. Uh, that's if you like mansions. Maybe you're not into mansions. But what is God preparing? Dwelling places. What's interesting about the word that's used there is it's a space that, that it's almost like God saying, I'm preparing a space for you that you don't know anything about. Um, good luck trying to figure it out. Could this be in my father's house or many dimensions, places where the soul exists when the body dies? That's why he's saying, don't let your hearts be troubled. Why shouldn't you be troubled? Because you believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many dwelling places. This is life after death. When you die, the Lord has a whole other thing in store for you. And, and this is where we have expectation of life after death. Um, this is God revealing to us in his word um, the, the deep things of God. I think it's pretty awesome. 
Um, Romans chapter eight, verse 11, Paul said this, but, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. Um, I love this. Uh, because Jesus rose by the spirit, the, whole, the same spirit in you that are Christians, you will be raised up from the dead. The word quicken means to be made alive. Uh, your mortal bodies will be made alive by the same spirit that dwells in you. So this is why um, this, this point that I'm making that the resurrection gives us expectation of life after death because Jesus rose from the grave. He proves there's life after death, but he has power over life and death. And he promises that right here in Romans eight, the same spirit that raised up Jesus from death to life is the same one that we get to have. And thus you're gonna raise up from the dead. Now, this is an important thing. Do you, here's, here's where it gets a little uh, sketchy and tricky in some ways. Um, how many people will be raised, resurrected after they die? Well, this might shock you and some of you are gonna think I'm a heretic for a half a second. Are you guys ready? Everyone is resurrected, everyone. Whether you're Adolf Hitler or Mother Teresa, Donald Trump or Joseph Biden, um, everyone is gonna be raised up after you're dead. The question, the big question that you all should be thinking about though is after you're raised up, what happens next? Do you go north or south? You see, the book of Revelation chapter 20 puts it this way, there's two resurrections. There's the first resurrection and the second resurrection. The first one is the resurrection unto eternal life and the second resurrection is unto eternal death. Well, Brett, isn't that just like you're dead and then you're raised up to dead? Pretty much. That's what the Bible says. In fact, there's a bunch of scriptures that should cause concern. Daniel chapter 12, Daniel ends his book with this statement. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25, verse 46, and the wicked will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. That's what I mean by north or south. You're gonna to go to heaven or hell. That's what the Bible says. I know that's not a popular teaching today among modern progressive churches, but it's what the Bible absolutely teaches. You go to heaven or you go to hell, it's one or the other. Um, not only that, Re Re Revelation 20, the scripture I was just referring to about the two resurrections, one to life, one to death, it, it goes on toward the end of that chapter and says, <clears throat> and if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So <clears throat> interesting, Jesus rose from the grave, proving there's life, and you can expect to have life after death. But maybe a, a more important question is when you're raised up after your body dies, are you gonna have eternal life or eternal death? Are you gonna be raised up for the purpose of eternal life or, or, or eternal death? That's the big question. And that's where I think my final point lands out of the three. And maybe this is the most important of the three points when it comes to the resurrection. The resurrection, number one, validation of Christ's claims of who he was and who he is. Number two, it gives us expectation of life after death. That's what the resurrection provides. But thirdly, it brings salvation for anyone who believes. Salvation for anyone. I love the word anyone here in my point, the point that I made, but I gotta say, it's really not my point. This is the Bible's point. Isn't it amazing? I say salvation for anyone. Um, you know, the, the world today claims to be inclusive. Um, it's su such a wacko, a hypocritical claim. The people that are talking about tolerance or used to talk about tolerance, they're not talking about that as much anymore, but DEI and inclusive and accepting and all this stuff. The world, they claim to want that and do that, but I've noticed the people that are harping on that the most are the least inclusive and the most brutal people I've ever met. As it turns out, if you want inclusivity, turn to God. Anyone who believes, anyone, I don't care what color you are, I don't care if you're a horrible, sinner, wacko person. The Lord is so accepting that anyone, where do I get that? Well, it's the whosoever of John 3, 16, the most famous verse in all the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, if you have a pulse, you're included on that. Talk about inclusivity. 
That's the Lord that we believe in and serve. In fact, Peter says, oh, the Lord would that none should perish, but that all would come to repentance. That's the heart of God. Um, now you say, well, why doesn't he save everybody? Oh, he's opening. Salvation is an invitation to anyone who believes. That's what the Bible says. When talking about the resurrection of Jesus, the Messiah, one has to understand why he died in the first place. And Paul the apostle nails this down for us. Why did Jesus have to die and then resurrect? He had to resurrect or else he wouldn't have worked. We talked about that, but why did he have to die in the first place? Um, it had to do with the penalty for our sins. Uh, the wages of sin is death. The price, the cost of sin is eternal death. Not just dying and being buried six feet under, but the idea is eternal death and hell that we were just talking about earlier. That's the penalty. And one of the things you need to understand is um, we, we all think, well, I've been a pretty good person. That's so off course. You, you need to understand the Bible says there's no one righteous, not even one. Did you know that you, when you went through the birth canal, I know it's too much information, but um, when you went through the birth canal, did you know you were born a sinner? You were already counted as uh, a sinner. Um, that's what the Bible says, because you, you're just a human being. We were born in sin. Uh, it's just the sin nature of humanity. It's the natural flow of everything human. It goes right to hell, because that's who we are. We're sinners. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Why? He had to die on the cross. Ephesians chapter two, I love this passage. I don't think this passage gets enough uh, time uh, because it's not John 3.16. But this is just like John 3.16, but it's even more, uh, uh, I think, uh, thorough in the explanation in the sense where Paul says, and you hath he quickened. He's talking to all the people from Ephesus. Hath he quickened. The word quickened there means to be made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. Remember I told you you were born dead in sin? Um, and it says, where in times past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, which is Satan, um, the, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. This is who we all are when we're born into this world. He goes on in verse three, among whom also um, we all had our conversation, our lifestyle, is another word there, in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. That's all the bad news. That's who we are. Paul's saying, you, you can be the best person around, but you're still part of this team, verses one through three. But then, I love verse four, but God. I've got that marked in my Bible, but God, because without that, you and I'd be toast. But God, it says, but God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love where, wherewith he loved us. Don't you love that? What is God rich in? Mercy, forgiveness of sin. Um, God is rich in mercy for his great love wherein he hath loved us. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together. There's that again, that quickened. I, I love that it says quickened us together with Christ. You see, when Jesus was raised from the grave, he was the sinless one who paid our penalty. Thus, we're dead in our sins. But when Christ rose from the grave, we're quickened together with Christ. For by grace, you're saved, it says there. What is being saved by grace? Saved by God's grace. Undeserved, unearned favor that God wants to show to you and to me. Quickened together. This is just a beautiful scripture. I hope you guys are embracing and loving this because it's huge. Saved by God's grace? Um, he's quickened us, made us alive. You see, we were born in sin. We were born spiritually dead. The Bible teaches, it's a, it's a doctrine the theologians call regeneration. Regeneration, some of you guys are like, is that having two generators out by the shed? No. Regeneration, uh, that's the fancy word. You might say born again, uh, regenerated from death to life. That's the doctrinal word. But born again is a biblical term. Also rebirth. Rebirth? Um, our, our rebirth depends on the resurrection of Christ. You need to be born again. Uh, well, Brad, speak for yourself. No, 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 you and I both, we all need to be born again. There's a big question. Have you been born again? Um, what does the Bible say about being born again? First Peter, I love what Peter says in chapter one, verse three, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his grace, mer great mercy, he hath caused us 
to be born again. There it is. To a what? A living hope. I love that too. Born again, not to a dead hope. You and I, in our physical, biological birth, we were born to death. Once you were born, you were doomed to death. Not only physical death, but spiritual death. But, but because of Jesus, according to his great mercy, we get, to be, we get to be born again to a living hope. How? How does that happen? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. There's only one way you can be born again. You're spiritually dead, headed for doomed hell. But if you're born again, you're spiritually awakened, rebirth, regeneration, whatever you wanna call it, born again to a living hope, that's through Jesus who died on the cross for your sins, but also rose up from the grave. Um, Christ rose from the grave, what to? To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, and kept in heaven for you. Man, reborn, reborn re rebirth, regeneration, uh, how important is it? Well, just, just ask Nick at night. Nickelodeon, what does that have to do with anything? No, um, remember when Nicodemus in John chapter three came to Jesus at night? Nick came to Jesus at night and asked him about this and, and Jesus started talking about how you need to be born again. And Nicodemus, who was a teacher in Israel said, what are you supposed to climb into your mother's womb and be born a second time? And Jesus said, oh, hey, it's like, hey, are you a teacher in Israel and you don't understand this? But one of the things that Jesus finally said to old Nicodemus is he said this, it's, it's John chapter three, verse seven, you must be born again. Question, if Jesus tells you that you must be something, is that important? I mean, this is Jesus saying this. It's not Pastor Brett, it's not some preacher, it's Jesus saying, you must be born again. Our rebirth spiritually is distinguished from our first birth when we were conceived physically and inherited our sin nature. New birth is spiritual, holy, and heavenly. It's a birth that results in being made alive spiritually. Did you know if you're not a Christian, you're dead spiritually? And it's no wonder that you struggle with spiritual things. Um, I, I've, I've noticed over the years, I've seen a lot of people come to know Christ and be born again. Praise the Lord for that. One of the things I've noticed among many is an, a, a person's ability to, to read the Bible. When you're not born again, you read the Bible and, and people just go, what a boring book. It's just a book of literature. Um, that's a good sign. When somebody's saying the Bible's boring, it's just a book of literature, that's somewhat of a sign that they may not even be born again. Because you need to have your spiritual eyes made alive again. You're, you're dead, you're blind. Um, to be born again, there's a, a spiritual um, awakening that God does for you, being born again. That's why we Christians, people wonder, why would you go to a Wednesday night Bible study, pack a giant sanctuary out and have a traffic jam out in the, in the I-205 for a Wednesday night Bible study? Um, it's just a book of literature. Well, no, these are people that have been born again who see the power of the word of God because they're, they've been spiritually awakened and the Lord is able to speak to us through his word. Not just a spiritual awakening, but also our justification rests on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The word justification, again, fancy word for just as if you'd never sinned at all. When you're justified, it's where the Lord takes your sin and puts it away and makes you brand new. Old things are passed away. I love the doctrine of justification. Do you know how it's linked to resurrection? Is this, Paul says in Romans 4, 25, Jesus, who was delivered for our offenses, in other words, they gave him to their tormentors to be crucified, and was raised again for our justification. Why was Jesus raised from the dead? So that we could have our sins forgiven and justified, just as if we'd never sinned. You see, the resurrection of Jesus Christ runs through all the blessings. It's like it's the silver thread through all the blessings from salvation onward, even to our eternal glory and hope of heaven, and it binds them all together. The, re the resurrection of Jesus is the thing that makes everything spiritually in the Bible work. Without the resurrection, like I said, it's the hinge that, that, that the door of Christianity swings upon. Um, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, one of my favorites, he's, he's my buddy from the 1800s, uh, people tell me that we're twins. I don't know. Uh, what do you think? <laughs> uh, I need to get one of those fancy canes. That's, that'd be cool. 
Um, <laughs> but old C.H. Spurgeon there in London in the 1850s, he said this, and I agree with him. The resurrection of our divine Lord from the dead is the cornerstone of Christian doctrine. Perhaps I might be more accurately, uh, I might more accurately call it the keystone of the arch of Christianity. For if that fact could be disproved, the resurrection, the whole fabric of the gospel would fall to the ground. You've got to accept the resurrection, that Jesus rose from the grave to be born again, to be a part of the kingdom, to be a saved Christian. You've got to understand the resurrection is essential. Um, do you remember when Jesus was on the road to Bethany because his buddy Lazarus had died? And Martha, um, the mother or the uh, sister of the brother, uh, Lazarus, comes running out to Jesus and meets him along the way. Oh, Jesus, she said, if you'd only been here, our brother Lazarus would not have died. You can kind of get the sense that she thinks, man, you, we know you could have healed him, but now he's dead, so there's nothing you can do about it. That's what she's saying. And that's why Jesus says, I think, if you, if you really think about all the verses in the Bible, um, this is one of the great profound statements that Jesus made here in John chapter 11, verse 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, remember I talked about it, we're all spiritually dead, yet shall he live. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? I love this because this takes it to a whole nother level. Jesus isn't just um, a way to resurrection and life. He's not the one even who provides resurrection and the life. He is the resurrection. He's the embodiment. The, he's, he is the power. He is the glory of every part of resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And there it is. I love that word. Whosoever, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And then I love that he asks Martha at the end, believest thou this? That's King James way of saying, do you believe what I just said? Now, if you know Martha's response, she kind of, uh, well, yeah, 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 uh, I believe that you, uh, whatever, there's life and resurrection and maybe whatever. She doesn't know what she's talking about, but Jesus is making something very clear. If you believe in me, you'll never die and you'll have eternal life. He's not a way, he is the embodiment of resurrection and life. And this question that he asked her is the greatest question you will answer in your lifetime. You might answer some big questions in your life. Um, the guy gets on the knee and, and opens the little ring case and then says, will you marry me? And that's a big question to answer. I do or I don't. Um, that's a big one. But that, that's puny, puny little question compared to, do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection of the life and that you need to be born again? Um, if you choose what college you're going to, tiny decision. What, who you're going to marry, what college you go to, what career you choose, all the decisions in life are puny little decisions compared to the decision, what do you do with this claim of Jesus, that he is the resurrection of life. Anyone who believes in him will have everlasting life. And the Bible makes that so clear. It's, it's spoken over and over again. The question is, believest thou this? Do you believe this? If your answer is yes, I do believe that, have you been born again? I remember a few years back, a little old lady, probably in her mid eighties, I'm guessing. Uh, I think she told me she was in her mid eighties. Um, and she said, I accepted Jesus today as my savior. And she says, I feel great. And I said, uh, man, I, I was just curious. You almost never see an 80 something year old accept Jesus. That's a really rare thing. So I just asked her, I said, why'd you wait so long? And she said, oh, Pastor Brett, you don't understand. I've gone to church all my life. But she said, I never knew you had to be born again. I never knew Romans 10, 9 and 10, the, the scripture I, I, that, and I do every Sunday talk about how you're saved, how you're born again. It's confession with the mouth and belief in the heart and accepting and believing that Jesus died, not just died, but rose from the grave. She said, I'd never been told that. Her impression was, well, if you go to church and if you give your money and if you're paying your taxes and if you're generally a good person, maybe you'll make it to heaven and hopefully your good outweighs your bad. And if you do something bad, you better go and confess to somebody. And like she had this whole construct that she was raised with for all those decades, but she'd never really thought about what the Bible really taught. And so that, that Sunday morning, she, she confessed Christ and was born again. You see, 
I think that people miss this. Being born again is a moment. Just like when you were born, your parents marked the time and the date. And since you were a little kid, you could say, my birthday's on June 7th, 1966. You can say that because everybody knows their birth date. But again, your birth date, do you have a spiritual birth date when you were born again, when you accepted Jesus Christ as your savior and Lord? Because if you don't, I would just ask, shouldn't you? Jesus said, you must be born again. That's an event. That's an event in a Christian's life. And how do you make that real in your life? Well, the Bible spells it out. It's actually quite simple. Um, Romans 10, 9 and 10. By the way, you have to start with repentance. Repentance just means acknowledging you're a sinner. Um, and by the way, repentance doesn't save you. You can repent till you're blue in the face, but that's not what saves you. But to get to a place where you are ready to accept salvation, you need to repent of your sins and realize, man, I've sinned against God and acknowledge your sin before God. So repentance is part of that, but it's not what saves you. Once you realize you're a sinner headed for hell and destruction, then you need to be saved. How are you saved? Romans 10, 9 and 10. It says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, just as if you'd never sinned. And with the mouth one confesses and is, is saved. There's, there's three components to this that are just amazing and simple. The hard one is, is the second one. The first one's easy. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, um, that's the first one. Uh, be careful on this one. If you're one, some of you are here on, on this Easter Sunday morning because you have a drug problem. Someone drugged you to church this morning. <laughs> Grandma said, it's Easter Sunday. You gotta come to church with me. And I'm like, okay, so there you are. Now I could invite you to accept Jesus and confess him with your mouth. And you might even go through the motions just to get grandma off your back but that's not gonna save you if you're just going through the motions and confessing with your mouth. The second part is maybe the, the key, not only confession with the mouth that Jesus is Lord, but you also have to believe in your heart. That's the deepest part of your soul that says, I believe, what? That God raised him from the dead. Isn't it interesting that the requirement to be born again is you gotta confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, not just that Jesus exists. The devil believes Jesus exists but you gotta believe that he's Lord and that he, you gotta believe that he was raised from the dead. And, and the idea is you're buying in to everything Jesus said and claimed. It's like all the stuff I've talked about, the, the raising from the dead validates all of the claims that he made. You're believing that. When you confess with your mouth and believe your heart that God raised him from the dead. And then the final component that's really key is you will be saved. Saved from what? Death and hell eternal. For with the heart one believes and is justified, with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Man, can I just ask you as um, persuasively as possible, would you please consider being born again if you haven't? Maybe you're one of those people that thought you were saved because you're at church. Um, doesn't make you a Christian, doesn't make you saved. You gotta be born again. You must be born again, Jesus said. I would love to invite you to do that. Would you bow your heads, please, as we close this service? And Christians, be in prayer. I'm gonna ask the band to come up and lead us in one final song here, just for just a second. But, but before that, with heads bowed and eyes closed, Christians, would you be in prayer? I wonder if there might be some of you who'd say, I, I wanna be born again. It's just that simple. Um, I, this is a great chance. I can't think of a better day to be born again than Resurrection Sunday, 2024. And if you're there at that place saying, I need to do this, I wanna confess with my mouth and I do believe in my heart, I, I wanna be born again and saved, forgiven of my sins, um, then let's do this. I'd love to pray that prayer of confession with you. Um, so, so again, I won't embarrass you. I won't make you stand up. There's no room for standing in here anyway. Um, but if you, just, if you just give me a quick wave, look up and wave and let me acknowledge you. If that's you, I wanna acknowledge you. That'd be great. You guys over there, cool. Don't let me miss you. I'm just gonna look around a second. You and you and you guys back there. Awesome. Anybody over here? Don't let me miss you. Cool, I see you. Awesome. Way back there and there. You guys over here. Cool. Awesome. I see you, buddy. You, yes, you. Good, man, that's so cool. I love that. You two over here and you guys back there. You and you. Good. Don't let me miss you. Cool. Man, I'm gonna just say this prayer of confession of faith and I'm gonna have the whole church pray this out loud. We love getting behind you guys and let's pray this prayer of confession together. Dear Father in heaven, I believe in your son, Jesus. 
I believe that he died on the cross for my sins. That he rose up from the grave and that my sins are forgiven. Help me to walk with you. Thank you for saving me. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Lord, how thankful we are for these who've just confessed faith, belief that you died on the cross and you rose from the grave. I pray, Lord, as so many of us, when we accepted you, it's, it's not that we have any feeling that confirms our salvation. You've done it already. But I do pray that they would just sense the forgiveness of sin and the, the, just the glorious hope of heaven. I pray that you'd put joy in their hearts, even on this Resurrection Sunday morning, as they've made the most important decision they'll ever have made in their life. Um, just confirm that, I pray. May they be hooked up with good Christian people who could help just stand with them and build them up in faith. Father, I pray blessing on them and, and upon this whole congregation. Lord, we're just so thankful for the, the fact that we serve a risen Savior. We rejoice and we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Let's all stand together. And what a glorious thing. If you just accepted Christ and, and, and were born again, the Bible says you're saved. Man, that's so cool. We have reason to celebrate. Let's do that. Before we go, let's just sing out. And, and man, don't, don't be wimpy on this one. Let's just belt it out because we have reason to be glor uh, glorifying God in Jesus' name. Let's sing this final chorus together. I give my whole life Resurrection Sunday service and just rejoice. Man, we have the hope of heaven and eternal life. No matter how bad things get on this earth, we have the glorious hope of heaven to look forward to because he is risen. And may the Lord bless you. We'll see you next time. You're dismissed.